Hello, everybody. Buenas tardes. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, uh, our two previous speakers, uh, Professor Kira and Professor Jones, have made really important contributions to this field. And I hope that some of you appreciate that what you've been hearing at this session today has really been cutting edge uh, information uh, that you should feel um, uh, privileged to hear and you can take back to your communities and you may be one of the first uh, in your area or your country to be sharing some of that information. Uh, I want to talk to you now about uh, an issue near and dear to my heart um, which is about testosterone and some of the issues that have been going on. These are my disclosures. Uh, it's been an amazing year for testosterone. In November 2013 came an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, that really for the first time in a major way suggested that there might be increased cardiovascular risks with testosterone, mortality, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Two months later was an article in a smaller journal, PLOS One, that seemed to confirm the JAMA article and that reported increased risk of non-fatal myocardial infarction in men who received testosterone. Two days after that confirmatory, or what appeared to be a confirmatory paper, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA in the United States, announced that they were going to review the safety of testosterone, and the European Medicines Agency followed suit shortly thereafter. In the United States, the impact of this was enormous. Now, arguably the most important newspaper in the United States, the New York Times, published an editorial that combined rising sales of testosterone with these information from the new papers and suggested that testosterone was being oversold and that it was dangerous. The danger was because of the cardiovascular risks. On television, in newspapers throughout the country, we saw headlines that testosterone is linked to higher heart disease and maybe an American phenomenon more than anything else, the lawyers got involved and we had advertised on primetime television every night advertisements from lawyers saying, did you have a heart attack? Did you have a stroke while on testosterone? Call us. And we now have class action suits in the United States related to testosterone use. The impact of these two studies has been remarkable. It has absolutely changed medical practice. We have patients who have been on testosterone for years without any trouble and with significant benefits who have stopped it because they're afraid they're going to get a heart attack. I've had patients that I've treated for years where their cardiologist called them and said, stop it immediately. You're going to die of a heart attack. Moreover, physicians who prescribe testosterone in their communities were sometimes seen as, really, you do that stuff? These papers have altered scientific concepts. It is no longer possible to have a testosterone discussion at a scientific meeting without discussing cardiovascular risks. This is completely new. And we have a new area of medical malpractice. Now, one would hope that studies that have had such a major impact would represent important, solid research but it's not so. And I'm going to show you a little bit about those studies. And what's really interesting and what I'd like you to be thinking about as I go through this talk is how is it that we as physicians or healthcare providers begin to form our opinions about what is safe and what is dangerous and what is useful and what is not and what are our influences? I would suggest to you it may not be <laughs> what you have always thought it was. And in fact, I would suggest that what we have is something that I call hormonophobia, and I thank uh, Professor Bruno Lunenfeld for this term. I think it's perfect. 
What's a phobia? Definition of a phobia is a persistent, irrational fear of a thing or a situation despite awareness or evidence it is not dangerous. And so we, everybody has phobias, or many people do, fear of spiders, arachnophobia, fear of heights, acrophobia. So what is hormonophobia? I'd like to define it as this, a persistent, irrational fear of sex hormones that includes testosterone and estrogen, despite evidence to the contrary. So let me just tell you a little bit about my perspective. I am what you might call a testosterone lifer. I've been working with testosterone for 39 years, beginning when I was 20, 21, working with these lizards, Anolis carolinensis, looking at the influence of hormones, especially testosterone and estrogen, on male sexual behavior. I published my first paper in 1978, and ever since then, testosterone has been really a central area in my uh, thoughts, and I've been paying attention to this as a primary interest. And what I've seen over these 40 years is something which is that testosterone is unlike almost any other scientific topic. It creates passions and emotions from individuals who are otherwise rational, cool, calm, and collected. And our first difficulty was really around uh, prostate cancer. Professor Kira, just a few minutes ago, described some of this but essentially, all of us who were trained more than five years ago learned that high testosterone caused prostate cancer or contributed to it. Low testosterone was supposed to be protective. I learned that eunuchs were supposed to never get prostate cancer, not true. And almost everybody here learned that if you raised testosterone or you gave testosterone to a man with an earlier history of cancer, that it was like pouring gasoline on a fire or feeding a hungry tumor. Professor Keir has gone through the data. There is no evidence for any of this. And yet we have believed it as an axiom of medical oncology. Dr. Kira showed this slide. Number one concern of physicians in many countries has been prostate cancer. And the most amazing thing for me is as the concerns of prostate cancer have diminished, as the evidence has come in that maybe it's not so dangerous and we even treat some men with prostate cancer, with testosterone, just as the fear has been coming down, all of a sudden we have a tsunami of worry about the heart. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what those studies were that have raised these concerns. Because once we understand something in depth, we know what its strengths are and its weaknesses. So this is the second of the studies. This is by Finkel et al. And its strength that was reported in many media stories was that it looked at a huge population, 55,000 men. But what was it? There was no chart that was examined for these men. This is the beginning of big data studies, which you've heard of. They had two pieces of information. They have a diagnosis code, which physicians put down in the United States in order to get paid. So there's a code that we use for myocardial infarction. And they had prescription data. So they were able to match prescription data with codes for myocardial infarction. There is no information in this study about any clinical information at all. Not prior history of MIs, really. Not smoking, not obesity. There are no lab results. So nobody even knew testosterone values. And what they did is they looked at the rates of non-fatal MIs 12 months before receiving a testosterone prescription for the period up to 90 days after the prescription. And the primary result was that there was a higher rate of MIs after testosterone prescription than before. I want to show you what this is the design of that study. So this is not an experiment. This is what really happened to people. It's looking at the charts afterwards. 
So it's not like there's a time zero and we follow people with and without testosterone. In fact, whatever happened is that the men received a testosterone prescription here and they looked at the rate of MIs that followed the receipt of that, pr of that prescription. And they looked at the uh, rates of MIs in the 12 months before the prescription. But instead of a study that starts here, the study here really starts here and it goes in two directions, okay? Now what I would suggest to you is that this period of time has nothing to do with this period of time. This is real for rates of MIs after a prescription. But what's happening here? Every one of these men who received a prescription, it only happened because the doctor determined that it was all right to give a prescription. He had access to the information that came before. So in fact, if this is a real rate of MIs after a prescription, what does this measure? This measures the willingness of physicians to prescribe testosterone to men who did or did not have an MI in the previous 12 months. This is not an experimental study. The two periods have nothing to do with each other. And the comparison, in my opinion, is meaningless. Even if you believe the study by Finkel et al., how big was the magnitude of the risk that they described? They reported one extra myocardial infarction per 1,000 person years of exposure from testosterone. What does this mean? One of my favorite lines was from one of my teachers, brilliant man, Alan Reddick, chief of, your, of pediatric urology, and he liked to say, I'm just a simple country doctor. Well, I'd like to suggest I'm just a simple country urologist, and for me to understand statistical terms, I have to make it meaningful to me. So I created this slide to share with you how I understand person years of exposure. Imagine a man in 2014 applies testosterone for 10 years. That's 10 person years of exposure. 20 years later, if his son decides to use testosterone for 10 years, we now in this family have 20 person years of exposure. If the grandson 20 years later uses testosterone for 10 years, in this family we now have 30 person years of exposure, and so on. If this is true in a family where in every generation one son uses testosterone for 10 years. How long will it take until we see that one event, non-fatal MI, it'll be 100 generations, 2,000 years, it will be the year 4,014, and all of our families and descendants will be living in spaceships. This may be statistically significant. It is clinically meaningless. The first paper, the one that really caused all the trouble, is this paper by Vegan et al. from JAMA. This was a retrospective study that looked at 8,700 individuals in a data set that was consisted of men who'd had coronary angiography. They selected out of that population of men, that's where they got the data, they selected men with low levels of testosterone. Some of those men went on to be treated and some were not treated. And so those are our two groups, testosterone treated, untreated, amongst men who'd had coronary angiography, looked at retrospectively. This is a quote from the abstract that gives the results. And the key item that was reported in every news and medical uh, journal was this. The absolute rate of events were 19.9% in the no testosterone therapy group versus 25.7% in the testosterone therapy group. This was at three years after coronary angiography. Except 
this isn't true. If one takes the numbers here, 7,486 patients who did not receive testosterone, and you look at the events they looked at, this many died, this many had MIs, this many had strokes, and you add them up and divide by the number of men, which is what absolute rate of events is, there was 21.2% in the no testosterone group, 10.1% in the testosterone group. I'm going to say it again because it is not a mistake. Real numbers, real absolute rate of events, the numbers of men who had an adverse cardiovascular event was half as much in the testosterone group as in the no testosterone group. How is this possible? The answer is that the authors of this study made a mistake, even though they're statisticians and epidemiologists, and it was not an absolute rate of events which all of you will appreciate is kind of our sense of what really happened. Real events, real number of people, divide it, get a number. What they used was a statistical methodology that has never been published before for reporting of data of this type called Stabilized Inverse Propensity Weighting Applied to Kaplan-Meier Curves. Within one week of publication of this paper, this was pointed out by me to the editor of JAMA, and the authors revised their paper so that it no longer said absolute rate of events, it became cumulative uh, percentage, uh, cumulative estimates, uh, estimated percentage of events by Kaplan-Meier curve, which sounds very statistical because it's very statistical. As if that weren't bad enough, in response to a challenge about why the authors had excluded 1,132 men, the authors wrote a few months later that they had reviewed the 1,132 men and they had made an error. When they looked at the data again, it was no longer 1,132, it was 128 men which is a difference of over 1,000 individuals. They took 900 of these and they put them in a completely different category. And then, oops, they also discovered that they had 100 women in this group, which represented 9% of the total. Imagine for a second if you saw a breast cancer study which mistakenly included nearly 10% men or a prostate cancer study that had nearly 10% women. Would you believe it? The authors stand by their results, the JAM editors uh, stand by the paper, but it's a little bit like this girl saying, my room is clean. <laughs> In response to these papers, and the impact it had on our patients and on science, a group of us formed what we call the androgen study group. The individual members are uh, Andre Gay, who unfortunately we lost uh, this past year, uh, Professor Kira, uh, Professor Martin Miner, and Abdul Trash, and we had some assistance from Monica Caliber. And our goal was to try and promote accurate reporting of these studies. Um, and so we did a number of things. When, the, uh, when it became clear from the authors of the JAMA paper that their data included nearly 10% uh, women and errors of over 1,000 individuals, uh, we circulated a letter to an, our colleagues around the world um, suggesting that the uh, paper should be retracted, that there had been gross data mismanagement and contamination, and this study was no longer credible. Within a very short period of time, some of you in the audience are included, uh, more than 160 distinguished researchers and clinicians signed this. We had more than 60 full professors, eight emeritus professors, journal editors from 32 countries all signing on to suggest that this article should be removed. Not because um, we disagreed with it, but because the data were no longer anything that could be trusted as being accurate, even if we disagreed with the methods. 
We got some press over this and put out press results. And within another couple of weeks, we had 29 medical societies that joined with us uh, in this. And I just want to read it just because I think it's fun to see the breadth of this. Uh, American Society for Men's Health, Brazilian Society of Endocrinology, Canada, Europe, Germany, Indonesia, several international societies, Italy, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, uh, Mexico, Middle East, Russia, South Asia, Singapore, Latin America. Truly, this was a global repudiation of this article. Now, how many of you know about this if you didn't sign it? You don't have to put up your hands, but the answer is probably very few of you. The original story gets the headlines, and then it carries on and has a life forever. And yet, the data that we saw is completely contradicted by a body of evidence that's been accumulating for 20 to 30 years. Uh, Professor Jones showed you one of his studies uh, in diabetic population of treated versus untreated men with testosterone. The treated men had a mortality that was half of the untreated men. This is a second study from the VA system in the United States by Shores and co-workers that shows exactly the same. Over a thousand men over the age of 40, low levels of testosterone, mortality was 10.3% in the treated men, 20.7% in the untreated men. If you look at a meta-analysis of testosterone cardiovascular risk, 75 randomized controlled trials. We see no increased cardiovascular risk with testosterone. Rather, there was a protective effect amongst men with metabolic abnormalities with testosterone treatment. Numerous studies have shown that low testosterone is associated with increased mortality. All-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality. Low testosterone is bad, and yet no one can show that high testosterone is also bad. It's all about low testosterone. And in a submission that we gave to the FDA as it reviewed the, these data around cardiovascular risks and also to the European Medicines Agency, we tabulated some of this information. And when we looked at studies looking at mortality, which we've just uh, reviewed some of this, uh, incident coronary artery disease, Severity of coronary artery disease, carotid plaque, intima media thickness, these are intervention, these are observation, fat mass and obesity, glycemic control. At that point, the score, if you will, versus beneficial studies compared to harmful studies was 46 to 0. This isn't equivocal. This isn't, well, it's a little bit this way and a little bit this way. In fact, the data has been accumulating in a solid, repetitive, uniform way that testosterone therapy improves risk factors as we know it, and low testosterone is associated with, uh, with uh, mortality and the presence of risk factors. We took some of our work, or we took this work, and we put into a publication which just came out about a month ago in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. And the conclusion of our extensive investigation of this issue was this. In summary, we find no scientific basis for the suggestion that testosterone therapy increases cardiovascular risk. We didn't say it wasn't true, but we couldn't find the evidence for it. In fact, as of this date, we are unaware of any compelling evidence that testosterone therapy is associated with increased cardiovascular risk. On the contrary, the weight of evidence accumulated by researchers around the world over decades, clearly indicates that higher levels of testosterone are associated with amelioration or improvement of cardiovascular risk factors and reduced rate of mortality. So we did something that was different than what most doctors are used to. We got really active, and I want to talk to you for just a moment about this. We submitted something to the FDA. We submitted our analysis to the European Medicines Agency. Our group presented to the FDA. We put out press releases. We did a comprehensive review. For those of you who are interested, by the way, in our work and you want to see PDFs of all these documents, you're very welcome to, and the website is there, androgenstudygroup.org. Our documents are there, and you can see a newsletter. Why do we do this? I will tell you straight away it has caused each of us a certain amount of difficulty 
because we are labeled as being pro-testosterone, that we are doing this for the benefit of the drug companies, and I can tell you that the androgen study group receives no and has received no payments whatsoever or any financial support. Several of us have received payments for research and advisory boards and consulting uh, independently, and others have not. But our group does not, um, and we do it because we think that it's important. I want to show you what the regulatory agencies have done. Before the FDA came out with its final report, it actually published an analysis, and it said about the Finkel study, it is difficult to attribute the increased risk for non-fatal MI to testosterone alone. About the vegan study, the FDA writes, given the described limitations of the study, it is difficult to attribute the reported findings to testosterone treatment. EMA, taking all the data into account, the signal for an increased cardiovascular risk associated with the use of testosterone remains weak and inconclusive. Nonetheless, just like the, this month, the FDA announced it would require addition of warning to testosterone labels that treatment may increase the risk of heart attack and stroke. Some people have said, well, it must be true then. But I want to suggest to you that the role of regulatory agencies is not to govern physicians or to insert or replace clinical decision making. Regulatory agencies are created to protect public health. They regulate the pharmaceutical industry. It is never intended to regulate MDs, and the FDA says so itself, as does the European medicines agencies. And we see warnings to labels all the time without the need for definitive evidence. But here's what question I want to ask you. Why do we believe these things? I showed you a score of 46 to nothing, and yet two papers, very flawed, come up, and all of a sudden everyone believes that testosterone is dangerous for cardiovascular risk. And I'd suggest to you that once we have a dominant idea in the media, or even in medical media or medical thinking, it is almost impossible to change it for many, many years. Huggins and Hodges wrote in 1941, testosterone activates prostate cancer. Dr. Kira has shown you all the reasons why that's not true. I talked, the title of this talk includes the term hormonophobia, which I would include estrogens. 2002, the Women's Health Initiative came out. Everybody learned that estrogen increases breast cancer risk as well as other risks. And yet, the WHI Women's Health Initiative published a follow-up in 2013 that reported in the estrogen alone arm versus placebo, breast cancers were reduced by 21%, statistically significant. The estrogen and progesterone arm had a little bit more, so maybe progesterone is an issue. But estrogen is not, and yet nobody seems to be aware of this fact, and it is repeated over and over and over again as if it's true that estrogen increases breast cancer. Not true, at least not by this study. So we think and we talk a lot about evidence-based medicine. I suggest we often practice media-based medicine. And why? Because we don't have time to read all the articles. We defer to trusted sources, and so we believe if something is published in a journal like New England Journal or JAMA, it must be true. The methods are so complex, few of us can understand it anymore, such as stabilized inverse propensity weighting. And the media, it works hand in hand with the journals to make the uh, most controversial stories a sensation. Increases impact factor for the, for the journals, and the media likes it as well. And I know my time is late, so I just want to leave you with a thought. There's something different between belief or opinion, if you will, and what I call considered judgment. Belief is an opinion. It's often superficial. It often comes from our own pre-assumptions of what may or may not be true. Whereas considered judgment comes from an in-depth knowledge of a field, including strengths and weaknesses of the evidence. I think the testosterone story has been a mess because it is full of belief, and many of those beliefs have been mixed up with issues that are non-scientific. We have 
feelings about anti-aging medicine and the way testosterone has been promoted. We have anger at the pharmaceutical industries, or some do, about their profits. We have anger at direct consumer marketing. All of this seems wrong. But this has nothing to do with the scientific question of whether testosterone may be beneficial for a man who's deficient or whether it increases cardiovascular risks. These are my first principles about that, that impel me to do whatever it is I want to do. Number one, what is scientifically true? And number two is what is best for my patients? How do we confront hormonophobia? Uh, I think the answer is <laughs> we present the facts and the evidence as calmly as possible. We separate out scientific issues from non-scientific. When we hear misinformation, we correct it with the facts. And then here's the scary part, is that sometimes it may be worthwhile to speak out when the science has been hijacked by non-scientists and when the health of our patients has been compromised. I can't say it any better than this, and I leave you with this quote by Galileo Galilei. In questions of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. Thank you very much.